as adults. But when it comes to children, it, it affects you differently because, you know, you don't want anything to come harm to kids. It just, it just hits you harder. I've been working for this paper for the past, well, going on my 32nd year. I started in the fall of 1977, the winter of 1977. 32 years later, I'm still here. I'm enjoying what I do. It's, it's never the same. This profession is never the same, and I think that's what attracts me. And that's what I enjoyed. It was telling people stories and trying to, trying to find those things that kind of people miss, you know, they don't see in the newspaper. And that's why I got into photography. That's why I stayed in photography. Okay, I remember coming to work on January 17th, and it was a really slow day. It's slow. I mean, like, I didn't have any assignments that day, I remember. And I was driving around, and around 11.15, 11.30, I decided to go home for lunch. And I live over there in the central Stockton by the Miracle Mile. And I always carried a little small police scanner. I still do. And I was taking it inside for lunch. I just kind of listened to the scanner. You're always listening for any kind of news in the radio and I was making a sandwich and I started hearing this first call about a uh, car fire. That's the first thing I heard. There was a car fire near Fulton Avenue. And then I heard there was possible shots fired. I drove up and I, and I took pictures of the car on fire and then I drove around toward the front of, of, the, of the school, which is on Fulton Avenue. And it was just like quiet. There was nobody on the playground, absolutely. You know, it was the, the silence, when I jumped out, it was almost eerie. I saw a, a motorcycle officer. He was kneeling over, now I know, Janet Jing's uh, body. She was wounded on the playground. And he kind of waved me away, like, you know, I'm, and so I just kind of moved toward the front of the school. Still at this, at this time, I didn't see anyone around the school. Everything was just super quiet. And then a lady, popped her head out of the office door and she kind of waved me in. And so I went inside the office, you know, instinctively I just kind of went inside the office to find out what was going on. And, and then as soon as I walked into the, into the office, you know, there is a, there is a sense of, uh, when you walk in and you hear a lot of screams and a lot of moaning, crying, and then you realize that it's kids that are wounded, hurt. And, you know, and I ended up shooting Wrath and Horror on the, on the office floor before he was taken out for triage. It was really hard for me to kind of concentrate on what I had to do in the beginning. And I told myself inside, calm yourself. You gotta control this situation. You have a job to do. You gotta take these pictures. Because my instinct was to drop my cameras and help. You, you know, when you first, you first uh, walk into a scene like that, and see being, you know, my background, because I was in, I was in Vietnam for 19 months, and there were certain situations where I had there's a, a certain odor to blood, to actually fresh blood. And I remember that. And it, it's really hard to describe, but you know it when you smell it, and if you've been around it. And that's what kind of hit me when I first went in there, because it's a small office. This, the sounds I heard was just a lot of crying, a lot of screaming, in fact, a lot of screaming and crying. And you know, it sounded louder than I thought it was, but then, once I started kind of focusing on my work, it's like someone turned down the volume. It was like I could hear I could hear the screaming, but it was not as loud. And so what I started to do is kind of internalize this stuff. I started concentrating on my cameras, what I had to do to get the pictures, make sure it's a certain shutter speed, the f-stop. And we were shooting color at the time, so I started saying, okay, I know they're gonna need color. And I remember 
put it on the, the 105 and I kind of stood back and I started taking pictures of tighter shots of the same scene of that lady cradling that boy with the bloody pants. Another two staff was holding this little girl, you know, and I had the other camera with the wide and I kept shooting, getting closer and closer to the scene. And I did that. I did that for as long as I could stay in the office until they started taking the kids out. And, um, and I remember uh, staying out there. And then uh, what, once the kids start being transported, my focus changed to the parents. You know, I, I had to see the one calming, you know, moment, the calming person in that whole thing was Pat Busher. It was, I watched her, I watched her carefully. If, it, if she would kind of lose it, she's the principal. Man, but she was, I don't want to say cool, but just, just control, very, very control of what she had to do. And, and I look back at, at how she had to handle that. It was just amazing. Further along into this day, they, they brought out a list. Oh, man, that was terrible. And it was the list of the wounded and the list of the dead. And, and I remember them reading the list or, or people trying to see what was on the list, you know, and, and uh, it was, and I think I finally got back to the lab around, I want to say six o'clock, six or seven o'clock. And I think I shot, I want to say, probably over 20 rows. I'm not sure how many prints we made. I, I think it's over 50, 60 prints, and huge ones. We did the big ones. We did the 11 by 14s, some made by 10s, and we used that paper that dries real quickly, I forget the name of it. But I remember not seeing, I seen the pictures come up. You know, it hits you, even though you know what you shot and you know what's coming up in that deck tall, it still hits you. And I remember looking those, you know, looking at those pictures and I... The next day I remember going right back out there again. I remember the aftermath is, the aftermath after something like this is almost as important as the day it happened. And, and now everything's changed. It became a national media event. It was a circus. You know, when you cover a community and live in a community, it's different. In the national media, they're after the story. They're after the story, exactly how it happened. And I don't want to say they're all insensitive because I've met a lot of good photographers who, you know, were generally very moved by what was happening here. It impacted them. But for them, they have to get the picture, tell the story, and then they leave. They're on to the next big story. And I remember trying to lose these photographers and finally getting to this wooden apartment building and we're going up to small steps. There's a different feeling. It was darker. They had cloth over some of the, the windows and the mainly Cambodian were in a semicircle and the monks were in the front and they were chanting for the, for the dead children. Okay, what I remember most about that day was when the coffins, when I saw the coffins, the four coffins at the rural cemetery. And I remember you know, again, the national media was there. It was a frenzy. And in fact, it was so bad that a lot of the family members at the time found it hard just to get close to the coffins. And we were kind of looking down at the coffins. And it, it didn't really dawn on me, you know, where I was at the time. But I remember shooting the pictures and then the footing, my footing, I almost lost my footing. And I looked down and it was this mound of dirt. And then I told myself, my gosh, we're on top of this dirt that was dug up for these coffins. It was a wonderful photograph, but I, I, you know, looking back, I wish I didn't take it. I wish I didn't take that photograph because I, I, uh, I wish some other photographer was up there from the record who took that picture. It wasn't one of my prouder moments. Th those images are important, you know. Uh, if I didn't take it, someone else would. 
and you look back at some of the, the photographs of some of these world events, you know, Vietnam, you know, 9-11, you know, Katrina, you know, I mean, tragedy happens and you have to have a record of it. And I'm not glad that it happened in Stockton, but, you know, we need those photographs because the, the telling image is there and it's not necessarily the blood and gore photograph. You know, you learn that over 30 years. You take it still and you put it away. I mean, you know, I think we're here to serve. We're here to kind of tell a story. And as true as that story can be, we're responsible for that. You know, we don't try to fake photos or try to put words into people's mouths. We try to tell a story. And if that story affects other people, we did our jobs. It affects me. It affects me. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't go by Cleveland School that often, but this, over the last five months, I've been there quite a bit. But before that, I could count on one hand how many times I've been in Cleveland School. The big, biggest thing about Cleveland School now is I go there now and kids are laughing, kids are playing. I, I love that. I love the, the normalcy of it. You know, classrooms, you know, teachers are teaching, kids are learning. You know, that's the good thing about it. You know, regardless that 20 years ago, you know, there's bullet, sh bullet shots, you know, in the playground. But you know, it's, it's, it's nice. It kind of, you know, it's like closing a big chapter in my, in my career doing this because I started it 20 years ago and then I, for me, I think this is the end for me on Cleveland School. I think I told my story and my pictures are hopefully would tell the same story.